In February 2024, Varda Space Industries' W-1 capsule landed in Utah after having spent around eight months in orbit. It was carrying space-grown antiviral medicine aboard. This Californian startup can be considered the first in-space manufacturing effort. The 200-pound capsule was designed to carry drug research into microgravity. This success makes Varda just the third enterprise to recover an intact spacecraft from its orbit around our planet. The other two are SpaceX and its Dragon vehicles, and Boeing with its Starliner capsule. You might know that SpaceX is a private spaceflight company that sends satellites and people to space. NASA crews traveling to the International Space Station included. The company is also creating and testing a Starship system that could be used for lunar landings and future crewed missions to Mars. But let's get back to the capsule from the W-1 mission launched by Varda Space Industries. It brought to Earth crystals of an antiviral substance grown in orbit. Varda is planning to become a major player in off-Earth manufacturing. According to the company, this production option offers loads of advantages. And one of them is microgravity. Microgravity or near-weightless conditions existing in the cosmos offer a unique environment for processing materials. These beneficial conditions are not available on Earth. Plus, it allows the formation of more perfect structures because there's no added stress that appears because of gravity. Varda claims that the W series stands alone as the only all-in-one commercial satellite and re-entry vehicle designed specifically for returning materials from orbit. Meanwhile, other operational re-entry vehicles are built with humans in mind. It means serious cost increases because of all the amenities needed to sustain astronauts. There have been private companies returning space-made products to Earth before. One of them is the Californian company Made in Space. It has brought home high-value optical fiber lots of times. But Made in Space manufactured its production aboard the International Space Station and then hauled the ZBLAN fiber down to our planet in SpaceX Dragon capsules. Meanwhile, Varda wants to make this process even more efficient and cost-effective. To do it, they're planning to use their small, uncrewed capsules. Those can serve both as mini factories and return vehicles. The W-1 test mission provided the company with the first opportunity to strut its stuff. Varda's three-foot-wide conical capsule was integrated into a Rocket Lab Photon spaceship. This craft was responsible for navigation, power, propulsion, and some other services. The mission lifted off in June 2023 on SpaceX's Transporter 8 rideshare flight. At first, Varda wanted to bring those crystals home after just a few months in orbit. Unfortunately, the company came across an unexpected obstacle. They had problems with getting the needed re-entry approval from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration and other authorities operating the targeted landing zones, the Utah Test and Training Range, and the nearby Dugway Proving Ground. Both of these areas are west of Salt Lake City. By the way, both places are no strangers to returning spaceships. Not so long ago, the return capsule of NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission landed at the UTTR. It was carrying more than 4 ounces of material received from the near-Earth asteroid Bennu. This seven-year-long mission delivered the samples in a return canister that came to a full stop on the 24th of September, 2023, parachuting into a remote stretch of land in Utah. The OSIRIS-REx sample is the biggest carbon-rich asteroid sample that has ever been brought to our planet. This space rock might help researchers investigate the origins of life on Earth. What makes the asteroid material so unique is the fact that it was captured in space. Most meteorites have to endure a fiery fall through the atmosphere of our planet, and we can only get our hands on their changed bits and pieces. On August 20th, 1977, the most ambitious space mission took off from Earth. The main goal of Voyager 2 was to study the outer solar system up close. It became possible because of a rare alignment of planets. 
Voyager 2 was supposed to study all the gas giants of the solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Astronomers also hoped it would be able to find and explore the edge of the solar system. Since Voyager 2 was built for interstellar travel, the probe was equipped with a large 12-foot-wide antenna. It allowed the spaceship to send the data it gathered back to Earth. During its journey, the space probe discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter. Voyager 2 was the only spaceship to study all four giant planets from up close. It was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, where it found two new rings and ten new moons. Voyager 2 also flew by Neptune and noticed its great dark spot. That's a colossal spinning storm in the planet's southern hemisphere. The storm is the size of Earth and moves at a speed of 1,500 miles per hour. These winds are the strongest ever recorded on any planet of the solar system. In the history of space exploration, only five spacecraft have managed to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. Those were Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons. People launch thousands of objects into space. These objects easily overcome Earth's gravity. But the Sun is around 300,000 times as massive as our home planet. That's why its gravitational pull is way more difficult to find. Even more impressively, Voyager 2 is the second human-made object in history to reach the space between stars after passing through the heliosphere. That's a bubble of magnetic fields and particles produced by the Sun and protecting the solar system. Two years after its launch, Voyager 2 started transmitting the first images of Jupiter. The space probe provided scientists with much-needed information about Io and Europa, some of the largest of Jupiter's moons. Then the space mission passed by the gas giant itself. The distance between the spacecraft and the planet was around 400,000 miles. That's when the probe noticed some changes in the shape and color of the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous, long-lived storm system, like a hurricane on Earth, but much, much larger. Two years later, Voyager 2 reached Saturn. It discovered spokes and kinks in some of the planet's rings. While the spacecraft was flying behind and up past the gas giant, it passed through the plane of Saturn's rings. At that time, Voyager's speed was around 8 miles per second. For several minutes, the probe was hit by thousands of micron-sized grains of dust. This kept shifting the probe's direction, and its control jets had to fire many times to stabilize the vehicle. After Voyager 2 explored Uranus and Neptune, it headed out of the solar system. Its instruments were put in low power to save energy. In August 2007, the spacecraft passed the terminal shock. It's the boundary marking the outer limit of the sun's influence. Here, the solar wind slows down. In the summer of 2013, the probe reached interstellar space. Now, when it comes to sending and receiving signals in space, there are three factors you should keep in mind – distance, power, and time. The farther away a spacecraft is, the farther a signal has to travel before it reaches it and the longer it takes for this signal to catch up with the spacecraft. And when it finally gets there, it's extremely weak. Another problem is that once the spacecraft is launched, it can't be upgraded. It's literally stuck with the technology it was outfitted with. Plus, such spaceships as Voyager 2 are powered by radioactive fuel. When special material radioactively decays, it releases heat that gets converted into electricity. Unfortunately, the more material decays away, the less power the spacecraft has for receiving and transmitting radio signals. Despite this issue, we haven't lost the connection with Voyager 1 and 2. That's because new and more powerful technologies appear on Earth. Signals people send can reach much farther than before. That's why it was possible to stay in touch with Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and has already traveled almost 12 billion miles away from Earth. But in March 2020, the main piece of equipment that allowed scientists to exchange signals with the spaceship was switched off. After the communication with the spacecraft stopped, NASA spent around 11 months upgrading its deep space network and installing new hardware. The DSN is an international array of huge radio antennas that help astronomers on Earth communicate with interplanetary missions. These antennas are located in California, Madrid, and Canberra. The one used to keep in touch with Voyager 2 is a 230-foot wide dish in Canberra. This is the only equipment that can send commands that can reach the probe. This antenna, known as DSS-43, started operating in 1972. 
five years before Voyager 2 and 1 were launched. At that time, it was only 210 feet across. Since then, the dish has received a lot of repairs and upgrades. But these 11 months were the longest the antenna was offline. In October 2020, the antenna was finally ready for a trial after all the upgrades and repairs. The mission operator sent a set of commands to Voyager 2, and after many months of radio silence, the spacecraft returned the signal. The probe confirmed it had heard the call. After that, the spacecraft carried out the commands. While the dish was offline, the mission operators could actually receive scientific data and health updates from Voyager 2. Astronomers kept getting data from interstellar space, the region outside the Sun's heliosphere. But they couldn't send any commands to the probe, since it had traveled too far away from Earth. The upgraded antenna received two new radio transmitters, and it was done just in time. One of the transmitters, that was used to communicate with Voyager 2, hadn't been replaced in almost 50 years. The antenna also got new cooling and heating equipment and other electronics necessary to support the advanced transmitters. Now, a curious thing about the Deep Space Network is that its radio antennas are positioned in a very precise way. They're spaced equally around the globe. This way, almost any spacecraft can stay in touch with at least one facility at all times. But Voyager 2 is an exception. In 1989, it made a close flyby of Triton, Neptune's moon. It was the only close encounter people had with the eighth planet of the solar system and its moon. By the way, Triton is the largest known object that is believed to be born in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring around the Sun full of icy objects. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's ring system and its tiny inner moons. The probe also gathered a lot of amazing information about Triton. For example, it became clear that the moon is covered in cryovolcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, these volcanoes spit ice consisting of water, ammonia, and methane. When the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto more than 25 years later, it discovered the same phenomenon on the dwarf planet. Anyway, to make this detour, Voyager 2 had to travel over the gas giant's North Pole. But this changed the probe's trajectory, deflecting it southward relative to the planes of the planets. Since then, Voyager 2 has been moving in that direction. And now, the spacecraft is so far away that it's out of reach of the radio antennas in the Northern Hemisphere, those in Madrid and California. This makes DSS-43, which is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the only dish powerful enough in broadcasting just the right frequency to send commands to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, the probe's faster-traveling twin, didn't change its trajectory. After passing by Saturn, it took a different path. That's why now it can easily communicate with the two facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The upgrade the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex has gone through can also benefit other space missions. For example, the Mars Perseverance rover that landed on the Red Planet on February 18, 2021. The dish will also be crucial for exploring other planets and the Moon. It would take between 1,000 and 81,000 years for a spacecraft to reach Alpha Centauri if we used conventional propulsion. Plus, astronauts would have to deal with the countless risks of the mostly unexplored interstellar medium. But there might be a way out of this seemingly hopeless situation. Gram-scale spacecraft that rely on lasers when it comes to traveling through space. One of such concepts is called the Swarming Proxima Centauri, and it has recently been chosen for the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. You see, traveling through interstellar space is a question of speed, energy, and distance. Proxima Centauri sits 4.25 light-years away from the solar system. That's 25 trillion miles, which is incredibly far away. For comparison, the farthest distance ever traveled by a spacecraft is 15 billion miles from Earth. Voyager 1 has been moving in outer space for more than 46 years, reaching a maximum speed of over 38 miles per hour. Traveling at the speeds that we can allow at the moment will make interstellar transit exceptionally long and totally impractical. And don't forget about the energy requirements such a journey would demand. Anything other than a tiny spacecraft weighing a few grams doesn't look feasible. But the solution might have been found. Bouncing photons off of a laser sail could solve the speed problem. 
But since a single photon doesn't have much momentum, a lot of them are needed. And since even in a couple of decades, we probably won't have a lot of power available, the thrust will be weak. That's why the mass of the probes has to be minuscule. Not tons, but grams. The proposal suggests using a 100-gigawatt laser beamer, boosting thousands of tiny space probes with laser sails to a speed of 10 to 20 percent of the speed of light. This mission concept might be ready for development around mid-century. Then, the probes could reach Proxima Centauri as early as 2075. The researchers involved in the project have already demonstrated how a fleet of a thousand spacecraft could deal with the difficulties of interstellar travel while maintaining communications with Earth. At the same time, the eight-year round-trip time lag caused by interstellar distances and general relativity makes it impossible to control the swarm of the probes from our planet. That's why the fleet must possess a great degree of autonomy when it comes to navigation and deciding what data should be delivered to Earth. One more issue is the cost of such a mission. The greatest expense will be the Lasser R ray, while the tiny probus might be reasonably cheap to produce. The scientists believe that their project can be developed with a budget of $100 billion. It's not so much compared to the usefulness of such a mission, which is likely to be astronomical. How come? Red Dwarf Proxima Centauri, which is a member of the Alpha Centauri star system, has an Earth-like planet orbiting it, Proxima Centauri b. It's the closest exoplanet to Earth. Its mass is similar to that of our planet, and it travels in the habitable zone of its parent star, which means there might be water in this world as well as an atmosphere rich with oxygen. This planet might harbor life, or it could be a dry rock, in any case, it's a promising target in the search for alien life. Unfortunately, we can't detect the planet's biosignatures because our usual methods for detecting them don't work with Proxima Centauri b. Most exoplanets are discovered and explored through the transit method, where a planet regularly passes in front of its parent star, and we see a recurring dip in the star's brightness. That's how we know that the planet is there. But Proxima Centauri b isn't a transiting planet. It was discovered by a different method. When we look at the light coming from Proxima Centauri, we can notice that the gravitational pull of Proxima Centauri b makes the star wobble a bit. That's how astronomers found out that the planet was there. They also managed to estimate its size and mass. But no one can figure out much more than that. Hopefully, a swarm of tiny space probes will help us solve this mystery. Traveling to space costs a fortune, but there's a way to make it affordable. You step into an elevator, push the button, and voila, you're flying to the stars, all thanks to nanotubes. But then something hits the elevator on the way. You're stuck inside, and now you're doomed to float in space forever. Now, if you want to travel in space, get ready to shell out around 55 million bucks. But in the near future, you'll probably be able to travel to space with just the push of a button without breaking the bank. Because space elevators might come into play. While the idea of galactic lifts seems like something out of a sci-fi movie, it is a real possibility that could revolutionize space travel. With an estimated cost of $8 billion, space elevators could be a one-time investment that would last us forever. NASA alone spends around $2.7 million on rocket fuel per minute. To launch a rocket, they need to pay up to $178 million. These costs could be significantly reduced with the use of elevators. Most super-tall buildings on Earth have a massive foundation to help with their balance and weight. As you look up, they get thinner and thinner. Even the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, is massive at the bottom and narrow at the top. If we wanted to construct something like a gigantic lift, we would need an enormous amount of concrete to build a foundation for it, which goes against the point of saving some cash. Now, get a string, tie a ball at the end of it, and start spinning it. The string in your hand will stay in one place, and the ball will revolve around your hand. This is called centrifugal force, and the elevator will work in the same way. The ball will be the base in space, and the rope will hang toward Earth.
The station from where we would enter the elevator would be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and the line would extend from there. For this to be possible, the line must be perfectly synchronized with Earth's rotation. Otherwise, it would simply break or wrap around the Earth like a scarf. Also, the orbit the line would be following should be a perfect circle, because the line wouldn't be able to get shorter or extend. A bunch of research has been done using algebra to find the ideal solution. Wait a second, there's a use for algebra? Never mind. Meanwhile, I won't bore you with the math. We'll go straight to the point where the precise distance from the station in the Atlantic to the one in space must be 22,236 miles above the Earth, where the geosynchronous orbit starts. There, the four outward forces are much stronger than the downward force. That's why the station would stay in one place. When you construct a house or a building, you start from the bottom going up. But to create this engineering wonder, we would need to do everything in reverse and start at the top. The main problem here would be the weight. If the line was too heavy, it would disrupt the orbit, and the conveyor dumbwaiter host would not work. So we need to balance the station in space to ensure it worked flawlessly. Steel is one of the most robust materials on Earth. The cable in every lift is made from steel. But when you need a 22,236-mile-long cable, hmm, things can get tricky. Steel is hard to break, but it's cumbersome. And when you have to use a lot of it, problems start to arise. We use heavy steel a lot in construction, but we have lighter materials that might put less stress on the station and eliminate this problem. Also, the line would have to be tapered because, at the end point, there would be close to zero stress but it would still have to be thicker than really needed due to a bunch of safety factors. At the start, the rope would be around 0.5 inches. After using some complicated math, we can figure out the thickness at the end, which is a number so long I am unable to pronounce it. But believe me, it's a big one. So, steel is off the list. Another candidate is Kevlar, which is five times stronger than steel. And if we added such materials as carbon and titanium into the mix, the strength would increase tenfold. The line would have a diameter of around 262 to 557 feet. This is drastically smaller than the diameter of the steel cable could be. The bad news is that doing this is too pricey. So if we don't find the ideal medium to build a cable, the idea of the space elevator will just be a massive waste of time. If only we had some magically light material with a power of 60 gigapascals, which would have a taper ratio of 1.6. Oh wait, we actually do have this unique material. It's called carbon nanotube. It has a strength of 130 gigapascals, which is much more than we need. Nanotubes are made out of carbon and are 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. This material is solid and has good conductive power, which is possible thanks to its unique atomic structure. We use this product in many things, from batteries to optics, and it can be modified entirely and adapted for more uses. Bradley Edwards is the guy responsible for this crazy idea. NASA was looking for new innovations, and they said, don't do anything too crazy and start building a space hoist. I guess Bradley took this as a challenge and started working on the elevator. Edwards wrote a paper about a galactic conveyor. When he published it, he expected many people to find flaws in his work. But surprisingly, nobody did. His work was spot on. He came up with the idea of strapping a nanotube line to a rocket and launching it into space. The other end of the rope would fall onto Earth, and robots would use this rope to climb up and make it longer so we could start building an elevator space station. After this, the elevator could start transporting everything, from solar panels to tourists. In the future, space tourism could be totally possible. Who knows? We might even go on vacations in space. Hey, looking for some atmosphere for your getaway? Well, don't come here. We don't have any. Oops, probably not a good advertising slogan, huh? Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, we could only create microscopic carbon nanotubes. But as time went on, much more research was done to make them bigger. Now they reach up to a few inches. In 20 years, they could be miles long. Carbon costs $28 per ounce. If we do the math, we would see that we would need around $1 billion to build a lift. 
Yeah, it sounds expensive, but it's a long-term solution to space travel, and it can actually save us a lot of money in the long run. Now, everything looks perfect on paper. But NASA's main reason why they chose not to go along with this project is that right now, there are probably more than 128 million objects floating in orbit, and they might pose a real threat to the elevator. The lift could be made to withstand a few hits now and then, but getting hammered nonstop is not part of the plan. Still, Bradley argues that tons of monitoring devices track space debris. Thus, the elevator could avoid them all. Now, if something hit the elevator or the line somehow broke, the consequences would not be too bad. If there were no passengers on board, of course. If the line got cut, the elevator would simply float away into space, posing no threat to people on Earth. In Japan, engineers are trying to build a space elevator. The lift could be used for space mining, too. We could easily cover the cost of the entire elevator by collecting asteroids, because some of them are made of expensive metals. We could mine them and quickly bring them back to Earth. You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited. Fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward, and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost 5 miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about 7 months and a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies, and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. People just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. Maybe even more than the entire universe has. But scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn, but this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So. The thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now let's make this model much, much larger and put the M-Drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the Alcubierre bubble. 
a Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket, instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away. The ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades, or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there. So there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, these probes could reach the sun in just 40 minutes. But instead, they will head for the star Proxima Centauri. After about 30 years of travel, four more years will pass before we get a signal from the probes. There are several exoplanets in this system, and some scientists hope to find at least traces of life there. But this sail technology can be used in space even without a powerful laser. We can use the sun. If we create a sail the size of a soccer field and unfold it in space, it'll start catching the sun's rays. And since the surface of the sail is reflective, the rays will bounce off the sail. This will create thrust and propel the spacecraft. One disadvantage of this technology is that we can only use it inside the solar system. In cold interstellar space, the sail won't be able to catch the sun's rays or solar wind. Another candidate for faster-than-light travel is an ion thruster. Like a conventional rocket, a spacecraft with ion thrusters would be propelled by gas ejected outward. Only, in this case, the gas would be ejected not because of fuel combustion, but because of an electric field. We'd need to create a powerful electric field inside the engine. Particles of gas passing through this electric field would get accelerated and ejected outside. This would create thrust. And although the acceleration in such an engine would be many times weaker than in a conventional rocket, the ion engine would be able to reach higher speeds. NASA was planning to build an ion-powered spacecraft to fly to Jupiter. Ion engines consume a lot of energy, so the ship was to be equipped with a nuclear reactor and lots of solar panels. Eight large engines were supposed to accelerate the spacecraft to about 56 miles per second. At this speed, the trip from New York to London would take one minute. So far, this technology has been actively tested on different space probes, but it can't provide a solution to how to travel faster than the speed of light. Perhaps people will still be able to travel between galaxies in conventional rockets, but they'll need to use some sort of shortcuts called wormholes. So, back to our space-time blanket. Point A lies at one end, and point B is at the other. Instead of traveling across the entire blanket for millions of years, you can simply fold it. Then, point B will be right above point A, and you can quickly get there through a short tunnel between them. Such tunnels are called wormholes. Some scientists believe that wormholes can be inside black holes. But there are two problems here. The nearest black hole is 1,500 light years away, so a trip there would take eons. The second problem is the hole's gravity. Black holes have the strongest gravitational pull of any object in the universe. Their gravity can crush any spacecraft. 
That's because the gravitational force increases with every inch you move closer to the black hole center. And the force affecting the nose of the spaceship will be much stronger than the force that affects the tail. The spaceship will stretch out like spaghetti and get torn apart. But there's a theory claiming that a spacecraft or even a person can survive falling into a black hole. But only if the black hole is super massive, like the ones that lie in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions and billions of times heavier than the sun. But even though they're heavier, they're also bigger in size. This means gravity probably doesn't increase so fast there. You or your spacecraft might not turn into spaghetti and might even get to see what's at the heart of the black hole. Have you ever tried riding your bike over nails? I guess it wasn't your intention, but if it happened at least once, you don't want to live through that experience again. Now imagine you'd have to ride your bike on Mars. Its surface is covered with rocks, canyons, volcanoes, dry lake beds, craters, and red dust. That combo makes those nails look totally harmless. No wheels we use down on Earth will do the trick. So NASA has been working on developing the perfect ones for use on the Moon or Mars since the 1960s. They tried smooth rubber tires with inner tubes full of nitrogen, large flexible wire mesh wheels, and airless compliant tires made of several hundred coiled steel wires. The spring tire. But nothing was good enough for the challenging cosmic terrains. The wheels of Mars Curiosity rover only lasted a bit over a year before they got seriously damaged. The rover's tires faced two big problems. First, they had to be strong enough to carry the enormous weight of the vehicle. Engineers tried to make it the most efficient vehicle for exploration, different from previous models that worked on the Moon and on Mars before it. That's how it ended up being so heavy. A big, heavy car needs durable tires, you know. And of course, the surface of Mars is no walk in the park. The engineers tried to make tires out of aluminum, which is a lightweight and strong material, but the wheels got shredded soon. The damage didn't prevent Curiosity from doing its job, but it did affect how efficient it was. And that's where the new, reinvented wheel rolled in. NASA decided to replace aluminum with a material called Shape Memory Alloy. It's made of a unique type of metal called nitinol, a blend of nickel and titanium. Unlike other materials that bend out of shape under pressure or heat, this cool substance reverts back to its original shape on its own in the same circumstances. Nitinol is the hero up on Mars, but it's also useful down on Earth. Just imagine your tires never getting punctured again. Sounds good to me. One company decided to use this tech on their bikes. The tires are tube-shaped and squashed down when you roll over a bump. They will develop perfect shape memory over time. They're supposed to work best on gravel, trail, and mountain bikes. The metal surface is covered with a rubbery outer layer. When it wears off eventually, the company plans to retread the tires to make them last for years. The previous airless tire models were made of patented foam that was supposed to last for up to 5,000 miles. They didn't take off because they made the bike too heavy. The new model is supposed to solve that problem. Nitinol also works great in the field of heart surgery. Tubes made of it can expand to the desired width under certain temperatures in the human body. The tire isn't the only object that works better with shape memory. If you can't imagine your sleep without that comfy memory foam mattress, you can send a thank you note to NASA for it. Its history goes back to 1966, when they decided to customize seats for astronauts to somehow ease the effects of G-force on takeoff and landing. Creating a custom seat for every flight seemed way too impractical, so memory foam saved the day. It easily adjusted to astronauts' body shape and went back into a rest state when not in use. In the 1980s, it went from space down to the earthly public. Now it's in mattresses, pillows, amusement park rides, horseback saddles, and football helmet liners. The third generation memory foam has gel particles and visco foam inside. That's the secret to its superpower of reducing trapped body heat, springing back up in no time, and making the mattress feel soft as a cloud. The name says it all, but in case you ever had your doubts, space blankets were, indeed, invented by NASA with space in mind. Back in the 1960s, they were preparing for the space era and looking for a thin, reflective, metallic material that would protect their spaceships from solar radiation. And they managed to design just the perfect material empiette, strong enough to be used as insulation to protect expensive space electronics from temperature swings. 
Ever since, it has been an important part of nearly every mission to and beyond the orbit of our planet. It's also used in spacesuits to protect astronauts from radiation and the sun's heat once they venture into open space. Down on Earth, space blankets are the best friends of marathon runners. Since body temperature drops after they stop running, they need something to help bring it back to normal. And the magical space blanket material can also protect your phone from extreme heat and cold when used as an insulation layer in a phone case. In the early 1960s, headsets for airline pilots used to be really bulky. They often had to use handheld mics to communicate. NASA needed a more reliable and lightweight technology for their missions to make sure the communication would go without any problems. In 1961, the Liberty Bell 7 capsule splashed down and astronaut Gus Grissom nearly sank without radio transmission or contact with his recovery team. NASA reached out to a manufacturing company to design a headset that could be planted into an astronaut's helmet. Just 11 days later, the team came up with a microphone headset unit that could be used by astronauts to communicate with one another and with Earth. It even had a noise-canceling feature. The headset was later improved and used for Mercury and Apollo missions. The world was able to hear Neil Armstrong's most famous phrase as he landed on the moon thanks to that wireless headset. Freeze-drying tech for food was not created but greatly improved by NASA to pack more snacks on long Apollo missions. During the first human missions, astronauts had to eat bite-sized cubes, freeze-dried powders, and squeeze semi-liquids out of aluminum tubes. Doesn't sound like a festive meal, right? The astronauts weren't happy about this diet, so NASA had to think of a better solution for the Gemini missions. They funded research that ended in developing special gravies that could go into edible shape in hot water in just five minutes. The idea of freeze drying is to cook food, then freeze it under low pressure, and then slowly heat it in a vacuum chamber to remove ice crystals. Thanks to this tech, food maintains 98% of its nutritional value with only 20% of its original weight. NASA kept improving the tech in the following decades. Now, freeze-dried food is a great help for backpackers, disaster relief programs, and anyone who needs to pack light and still get proper nutrition. The infrared thermometer that lets us check temperature from a distance was developed with the support of NASA as well. It measures thermal radiation emitted by your eardrum, a lot like they measure the temperature of stars and planets. Each device has a lens that focuses light from the object onto a special detector that converts radiation into an electrical signal and then into temperature that you can see on a display. It's used for many purposes, from monitoring hotspot temperatures in mechanical and electrical systems to checking the temperature of visitors in public places. I bet you didn't see this one coming. The technology behind selfies comes from that designed for interplanetary missions cameras. In the 1990s, one of NASA labs, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, introduced a light mini imaging system that didn't need a lot of energy to take high quality photos from space. This tech is used in cell phone and computer cameras. And if we go back to the 1960s, we'll find some good evidence that the whole idea of selfies could belong to astronauts. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, took some selfies up there with a specially designed Hasselblad camera. He even used the spacecraft as a tripod to stabilize the image and get his face in it. Remember this if you ever end up in space with no one to take photos of you. Hundreds of diplomatic spaceships take off from Earth and head into space. When they reach their destination, they're met by hundreds of alien ships. This is humanity's first contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. People managed to detect them not so long ago, in a star system very close to our home. It's Proxima Centauri. This red dwarf star is the closest to our solar system. It's seven times smaller than our sun, which makes it only 50% bigger than Jupiter. Proxima Centauri is also eight times as light as the sun. This star system is 4.2 light years away. That's how long it takes a photon of light to travel from this star to Earth. By comparison, it only takes eight minutes for sunlight to reach our planet. If you decided to travel to Proxima Centauri, it would take you about 73,000 years to fly there in a conventional rocket. That's longer than our intelligent civilization has even existed. But it's not the star itself that interests us. It's the planet orbiting it. That's Proxima Centauri b. It's 17% bigger than Earth and about 10% heavier. 
it orbits its star at a distance of 4.5 million miles. By comparison, Earth is 93 million miles away from the Sun. That's 20 times farther. But the host star, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf. It doesn't emit as much light and heat as our Sun. So the planet Proxima Centauri b is right in the habitable zone of the star. It's located at such a perfect distance from its mother star that the planet neither gets too hot nor turns into a block of ice. In other words, the temperature there makes it possible for water to exist in its liquid state. This means that Proxima Centauri b could host life. But further observations of the planet make it doubtful. The host star is very unstable. Its brightness changes too frequently. In 2017, astronomers witnessed a catastrophic flash. The star increased its brightness by 1,000 times for 10 seconds. Before that, there was another weaker flash. The planet received an enormous amount of radiation. If there had been life there, that flare would have wiped it out completely. Overall, Proxima Centauri b receives about 400 times more X-rays than Earth. Complex living organisms cannot live under such conditions. Scientists say that even if there was an atmosphere and an ocean on Proxima Centauri b, this constant radiation would simply blow them off the planet. Proxima Centauri b is so close to its host star that it's gravitationally locked to it. This means that the planet is always turned to the star with only one side, just like the moon is turned toward Earth. That means that only one side of the planet receives this awful amount of radiation. And some experts speculate that an intelligent civilization might live on the night side of the planet. And it could be this civilization that sent us the strange signal that astronomers caught in 2019. Scientists described it as, quote, a bright long duration optical flare, accompanied by a series of intense coherent radio bursts. This radio signal was observed for 30 days by one of the radio telescopes on Earth. Scientists thought the signal was artificial and could have been sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. Presumably, the signal came from Proxima Centauri b, or one of the moons that might be in that star system. But further observations failed to detect the signal. Now, the main theory claims that this radio signal is just some kind of interference from some technology on Earth. But what if it was really sent by a civilization living on the dark side of Proxima Centauri b? Well, we may soon find out for sure. People are launching a brand new telescope into space. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's scheduled to be launched at the end of 2021. A booster rocket will take off from Earth and reach orbit. Then, it'll deliver the telescope to a specific point between our planet and the Sun, where their gravitational forces are roughly equal. Plus, there's no light pollution in space, unlike on Earth's surface. There are also no clouds or other weather conditions that might interfere with the telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will replace the Hubble Telescope, which has been operating in space since 1990. The new telescope costs $9.8 billion. And here's why. It'll use a mirror as wide as a boxing ring. This will allow the telescope to see very far into space. So far, in fact, that the light from some events happening there won't have reached Earth yet. This means we will literally be able to look back in time. The James Webb Space Telescope will see the universe almost immediately after the Big Bang. We'll see how the first stars and galaxies were born, and how the universe turned into what we observe today. But also, this telescope can be used to examine Proxima Centauri b. Astronomers will be looking for artificial light there, like the LED lights we have on Earth. If Proxima Centauri b really hosts life on its night side, then the locals must have learned to transfer heat and light from the day side of the planet, and they would have to use artificial light to support life on their side. The James Webb Space Telescope is powerful enough to distinguish the light waves emitted by the star from those that might be created by someone on the dark side of the planet. And if we do detect some artificial light, we'll have the first ever confirmation that an intelligent civilization might exist outside our solar system. But there's always room for error in calculations and data interpretation. The only way to establish the truth once and for all is to send a space probe to Proxima Centauri. Then we can get real pictures of the planet. The main problem is distance. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest to the Earth star system, it still takes tens of thousands of years to get there. After all, 
The Voyager 1 space probe needed about 44 years just to leave the solar system. And that's just a small step compared to the actual distance to the nearest star. So we need other methods of travel, and they have to be much faster. Some scientists want to send microprobes to Proxima Centauri b. They won't be any heavier than a sewing needle. A launch vehicle will deploy about a thousand of these probes into orbit. Then they will unfold a space sail. This is an ultralight material that will use the power of light to create thrust. When the sail is deployed, we'll focus a powerful laser beam onto it. This will accelerate the probes to about 20% of the speed of light. This will be an absolute speed record by our standards, but it'll still take about 21 years for these probes to reach their destination. And we'll have to wait for about four more years just to get the first signal from them. The Proxima Centauri star system isn't the only potential world to host life. And one of the tasks of the James Webb Space Telescope is to look out for other worlds. The telescope's powerful instruments will allow it to find relatively cold planets where temperatures are close to those on Earth. We'll be able to study in detail around two dozen nearby star systems. And we'll be able to detect not only planets themselves, but also their moons. Scientists expect a boom in the discovery of exoplanets. From the start of the telescope in 2022, we'll constantly be detecting new worlds and learning more about those already discovered. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to better study our own solar system. Jupiter's moon Europa, for example. Scientists believe there might be water there. Although Europa looks like a block of ice, the moon's gravitational interaction with Jupiter heats its core. That likely makes the ice deep below the surface melt. So there's likely to be an ocean under the ice crust. Similar conditions could exist on Enceladus, Saturn's moon. This moon is geologically active. There are geysers that burst out of the cracks on the moon's surface. The James Webb Space Telescope's infrared instruments will be able to explore Europa and Enceladus in search of biosignatures. Those are the traces of life activity of living organisms or bacteria. This telescope is scheduled to operate for about six years. But in the future, we'll launch an even bigger one. It's called Louvoir, which stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. Its mirror will be twice the size of that of the James Webb Space Telescope and almost seven times the size of the Hubble's. The telescope is scheduled to be launched in 2039. We'll get it into orbit with the help of a super heavy rocket. Then we'll have to deliver the telescope to its destination, one million miles away from Earth. And then it'll begin its observations. We could learn to travel faster than the speed of light by that time. Then, if we find a potentially habitable planet with the help of the telescope, we can send a space probe or even a team of explorers there. In this case, a diplomatic meeting with an extraterrestrial civilization might become a reality. You take a rocket to the moon. It lands. You put on your work uniform and go to work your shift at a local factory that extracts water from beneath the surface of the moon. There's also fuel plants here. Dozens of people in rovers are roaming the expanse of Earth's natural satellite. When your shift ends, you board the rocket again. It takes you back home, just like a regular bus. That's exactly what NASA is planning to do. In the first stage of this project is the PRIME-1 mission. PRIME stands for Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment. The mission starts in 2022. Let's follow it step by step. A booster rocket in second stage are assembled on the launch pad. Ignition. The rocket's engines begin to burn fuel, and we go up. Soon, the rocket reaches a speed of about 24,000 miles per hour. At that speed, you could travel the distance from New York to London in just eight minutes. Once the booster uses up all its fuel, it undocks and makes a soft landing on Earth. The second stage with the payload capsule fires its engines a couple of seconds after the first stage undocks, so the rocket continues moving up. Once it reaches orbit, the payload capsule opens. It releases the lunar lander Nova C. It's a cylindrical spacecraft, as long as a sedan, and slightly wider than the height of the average person. It starts its engine and begins its journey. First, the lander makes a circle around Earth. This is a gravitational maneuver that helps it to gain speed without wasting too much fuel. Because the lunar lander is still in orbit, Earth's gravity affects it. The spacecraft looks as if it's fallen, but not to the surface of our planet, along its orbital trajectory. 
After one lap around Earth, the lander adjusts its trajectory and heads for the moon. The distance it needs to cover is 238,600 miles. That's like 9.5 trips around Earth, or 93 trips across the United States from coast to coast. Modern spacecraft can cover this distance in as little as nine hours. That's a bit more than a journey from New York to Los Angeles by plane. At the same time, it took the first astronauts about 72 hours to get to the moon. Soon, Nova C is near its destination. It makes another circle around the moon while it descends. Scientists have already chosen the perfect plane for it to land. There are several requirements. First of all, there should be signs that there might be ice under the surface in this location. Second, the lunar module should be able to maintain radio communication with Earth, and this is impossible if the lander is on the far side of the moon. When the first astronauts flew around Earth's natural satellite, contact with them was lost for a few minutes. The connection only resumed when their spacecraft came out of the lunar shadow. And the last requirement for the landing area is sunlight. The lander has solar panels to power its scientific equipment, onboard computers, and communication modules, so it needs direct sunlight. The lander is getting closer to the surface of the moon. The spacecraft is slowing down as it approaches the landing site. Now, it's almost hovering in midair. A few more seconds, and touchdown. The spacecraft makes a soft landing. It's time to drill through the surface. For this, the lander has a device called the regolith, an ice drill for exploring new terrain. To put it simply, it's a large, three-foot-long drill. That's almost as long as a grown-up person's leg. Once the right spot is chosen, the device gets lowered into the lunar soil. Drilling will have several stages. Lander will have to lift the drill several times to get the soil out of the drill hole. Otherwise, it may damage the drill bit. Next, the lander will have to analyze the soil composition. To do this, it carries a mass spectrometer, observing lunar operations. Shortly, M. Solo. Its work is based on a simple principle. It ionizes or charges particles of soil, making them move. Then it creates a strong magnetic field, which affects the charged particles, making them change their trajectory. Different substances, their molecules, and atoms move differently in the magnetic field. So, by analyzing the changes in their trajectories, we can identify the mass and charge of each particle. All we need to do next is look at Mendeleev's periodic table and see which atoms we can find in the samples. Scientists hope to find H2O, water. The south pole of the moon is an ideal place to keep ice within reach of our drill. The equator would be a great place to maintain radio contact and power the solar panels of the lander, but this area is likely to be too hot to have any ice. The lander will also carry a lunar hopper. This thing will be used to explore the surface of the moon. It will carry a load of about two pounds. Scientists will also test 4G communication technology. The lander should have some special modules for this. If the test is successful, people might be able to use cellular coverage for communication on the moon, like we do on Earth. But the main goal of the mission is to prove that the resources found on the moon can be used in the future. As early as 2023, NASA plans to send an autonomous rover called VIPER, which stands for the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, to the moon. It'll land at the moon's south pole for the same reasons, the connection with Earth and sunlight. The rover itself will be about the size of a golf cart. It'll carry a drill and soil analyzer. Scientists have already laid out a route for the rover. It's about 10 to 15 miles long. It'll take Viper 100 days to travel along that route. It'll drill the soil in search of lunar ice and mark its findings on the map. It will be necessary to prepare for astronauts' arrival to the moon. It'll also help to provide them with valuable resources, like water. Later in the 20s, NASA will launch the Artemis mission. For this purpose, scientists have been constructing the Orion spacecraft for decades. It can carry six astronauts. The launch vehicle that will take Orion into orbit is called the Space Launch System. When ready, it'll be the most powerful rocket in human history. The first flight will be uncrewed. It's scheduled for 2022. Like the lunar lander, the spaceship will ascend into orbit make one revolution around our planet and go to the moon. Once it reaches the satellite, it'll stay in orbit for six days and then return to Earth. It'll spend a total of 25 days in outer space. 
The second mission is planned for September 2023. This time, we'll send four astronauts to the moon. They will fly around Earth's natural satellite and return without landing on the lunar surface. This will be the first crewed mission to the moon since 1972. The third mission, Artemis III, is scheduled for the 55th anniversary of the first lunar landing in 2024. Four astronauts will travel to the moon's orbit. Once there, two of them will move to the starship HLS. This is a new lunar lander designed by SpaceX. Then they will make a soft landing on the moon's surface. The astronauts will spend several days there. Then the lander will fly back into orbit, dock with Orion, and return to Earth. There's also plans to build a space station in lunar orbit, the Lunar Orbitable Platform Gateway. It'll be almost like the International Space Station. It'll be assembled from a lot of modules, just like the ISS. There will be a power and propulsion element. This is going to be the first module equipped with engines for maneuvering and propulsion. There will also be solar panels that will power the station. One more module will serve several purposes, including communication and refueling. Then, there will be several living modules. They will be able to host several astronauts for a period of up to 90 days. That's where they will eat, sleep, train, and conduct scientific experiments. The station will be equipped with a robotic arm. It'll help spacecraft dock with the station, as well as install additional scientific equipment outside the station. There will be an airlock module. Incoming spacecraft will be able to dock with the station there. It'll be like a parking lot for dropping off and picking up passengers. Astronauts will be able to use it as a door to outer space. There will be a sample return vehicle, a small spacecraft, that will deliver samples of lunar soil to the station. It'll be fully robotic. The Gateway will be much smaller than the ISS. For comparison, the Near-Earth Station now consists of 11 modules, and its total cost is about $150 billion. In the future, we'll use this station as a launch pad to send spaceships to other planets, like Mars or into deep space. Rockets launched from the ISS will need much less fuel, because they won't have to fight Earth's gravity. But the astronauts on the Gateway will be in more danger than on the ISS because of radiation. Earth's magnetic field acts as a shield that disperses the sun's harmful rays. And astronauts staying there don't get much more radiation than the passengers of a commercial airplane on Earth. The moon is too far from our planet's magnetic field, so all the modules of the Gateway Station will have to be additionally protected from solar radiation.